So here's a question. Well, we've, we've kind of talked about cardinality of sets, right? But usually that was involving like finite sets. You know, if I've got the cardinality of the set of numbers one up to 10 is 10, right? These kinds of things. Um, here's a question. Are the natural, is, you know, is the set of natural numbers and the set of real numbers, you know, are they the same size? They're both infinite, right? So I guess in some sense you might think, yeah, infinity equals infinity, so they're the same size, right? Uh, maybe let's go for a vote. So who thinks they are the same size? I know there's going to be some weird thing that I actually <laughs> yeah. uh, Who thinks they're not the same size? And who thinks this is just a stupid question? Probably doesn't have any meaning. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's good reasons for both, right? I mean, they're, they're both infinite size. So in some sense, if you just think, okay, infinity equals infinity, they're the same size, whatever. But there's another reason, I mean, there's a good reason why they might not be the same size, right? Like this one is a subset of that one. Like clearly it seems like the real numbers has more, more stuff in it than the natural numbers. So that kind of pushes you in the other direction. Maybe they're not the same size. Maybe this one's bigger, right? Certainly this one's, okay, I think nobody thinks that this one's bigger, right? This one's definitely at most as big. If you're able to feasibly count, then yes. Uh-huh. That's actually a really good word. Count is a really good word. Um, I mean, this is, it's kind of fore foreshadowing what's going what's gonna to happen. Uh, so the answer, the answer is going to be no, but we need to kind of quantify what this question even means before we can answer it. Essentially though, it kind of is because of something to do with counting. So you can, and essentially the reason is that, okay, you can't count the natural numbers because there's infinitely many, but you can kind of, if you're allowed to count forever, you can count them all. You can just go one, two, three, four, five. In some sense, if you, even if you can count forever, you can't, list out all the real numbers in a row. That's kind of the reason these are not the same size. But to, to uh, kind of address your question, if I say, well, another natural question is, are, are the naturals and the rationals the same size? So remember the rationals, I mean, we've just been playing with them in the ICA. This is the, all the fractions of integers. Um, so it might seem that these are not the same size as well, right? There's a lot more rationals than there are naturals. In particular, if you do you know, your kind of argument, for every natural number you can get like k, or you can get as many, you know, lots of rationals. Uh, in this case, the answer is gonna be yes. Is it just because r includes some weird ones that you can't like count? <laughs> Essentially, yeah. Like a normal, like a normal it's because of things like irrational numbers. For example, yeah. Uh, so let's uh, let's try to get some meaning of this question. So how do I say that two sets have the same size? Okay, for finite sets, it's easy, right? Count the first one, count the second one. Oh, are they the same size or not, right? Um, but that doesn't work very well for infinite sets. So so in the in the videos, at some point. I proved some proposition about finite sets. And this is gonna be a sort of foreshadowing of uh, how it works for infinite sets. So, so this was back in chapter seven. We proved the following. So let A and B be finite sets. Then they have the same size if and only if there exists a bijection from A to B. Okay, I'm not gonna prove this again, but so for finite sets, this gives us another way of saying they have the same size, right? Two finite sets have the same size if there's a bijection from one to the other. And that kind of gives us a better way of dealing with infinite sets as well, because you can't count up all the elements of an infinite set, but you could maybe have a bijection between two sets. 
So let me now give a definition. So say that sets A and B are equinumerous. Essentially, I'm trying to say that they have the same size. Uh, if there exists a bijection f from a to b. Or in other words, you can say, instead of equinumerous, you can say that they, they have the same cardinality. Except that's a bit of a longer thing to say. Here, I'm not saying anything about them being finite, so they might be infinite. And we say that they, essentially we say that they have the same size if there's a bijection between them. A bijection from one to the other. Okay. So the question of you know, asking whether the naturals and the reals have the same size, what I'm really asking in this question is, are they equinumerous? Like, is there a bijection from the naturals to the reals? And here I'm asking, is there a bijection from the naturals to the rationals? So in this case, the answer ends up being no, and in this case, the answer ends up being yes. And we'll prove that in the, the rest of this week. Um, okay. So let me now give a, oh, yeah, prove a proposition. So this is proposition 8.1.1. So what I want to prove is that this, so this is a relation, right? Saying two, thing, two sets are equinumerous, that's kind of a relation between two, you know, between sets. It indicates a relationship between them. And I want to say that this is an, an equivalence relation. So, so let, well, let, let's say U be a collection of sets. And let tilde, this you know, squiggle thing, be a relation on U such that A is related to B if A and B essentially have the same size, so I'll just use this word again, equinumerous. Okay. So I, what I want to prove is that this is an equivalence relation. So then this squiggle thing is an equivalence relation. So the relation stuff is coming back again. <clears throat> OK. Um, so this thing, this, this uh, symbol is not a function, really. So it's not like we don't prove that this is a bijection. But you want to prove that, yeah, the relation where A is related to B if and only if there's a bijection between them. Yeah, you want to say that this is an equivalence relation. It's a bit, yeah, it's kind of a bit complicated, I guess, to say. Um. So, okay, let's, let's, uh, so, yeah, I think the statement of this proposition is maybe seems a bit technical, but uh, I think when we get into the proof, it, it won't be as bad. Um, how do you prove something is an equivalence relation? Remember, you have three things to show. Yeah, exactly. So let's prove it's reflexive. So... Let A be any set in U. In some sense, I, this, this U thing is a bit, it's a bit annoying that I have to define some collection of sets. The problem is that, yeah, the set of all sets isn't a set. So that's why I have to have this U. But, but don't worry too much about the U. 
Okay, what do I want to show for reflexive? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So we want to show that it, this, so we pick it just any element of U, we want to show it's related to itself, right? How do I find a, so how would I show that a set's related to itself? Well, I have to find a bijection from A to itself. But that's kind of easy, I think. You just, like if you think about, I mean, you just map every element to itself. So, so if I take the identity function, so this was something which, which was in the videos as well, this thing about an identity function. Uh, so the kind of notation for this was iota subscript A. Um, so the definition is that it just maps every element to itself. Uh, is a bijection from A to A. So A is related to itself. In some sense, I'm sort of skipping things here a little bit by, I mean, formally speaking, I should probably prove it's a bijection, but that should be pretty easy, right? If I take x and y such that the identity of x equals the you know, identity function of y, that just immediately applies, implies x equals y, so it's injective. Um, surjective is just as easy as well. Um, in this case, in this case, actually, the way we've defined this equinumerous thing is just that there exists a bijection from A to A. So, from kind of from this statement, like well, that this is a bijection, we immediately can write this. So we don't have to write anything about cardinalities actually at this point, just because we, yeah, the way we've defined this is is just that there exists a bijection. Um, yeah. Yeah. You probably, probably to be safe, you might want to do it. You, but you probably won't be asked to prove that the identity function is a bijection because it's. But in theory, if it came up in what you were doing, you may as well just write a little proof. But it's yeah, it shouldn't be too difficult. Um, yeah. I'm sort of yeah. I feel like if I gave even more detail on this, it would just make things confusing. Well, and it would take a lot of time, so, so I might not. I'm kind of following the notes, which just say, oh, it's a bijection. But, but I kind of, yeah, I kind of agree that, yeah, you might want to prove it if, if it was like a, a test or, or an assignment. Um, OK, let's talk about symmetric then. So, suppose that A is related to B for some A, B in this set U. So we want to, for symmetric, you assume A is related to B and you want to prove that B is related to A. So there exists a bijection F from a to B. So does anyone see how I'm going to get a, a bijection from B to A? Yeah, exactly. So, so I want to take the inverse of F. 
And I'm allowed to do that because f is a bijection. So this was another thing that was in the videos at some point. If you, you have a bijection, every bijection has an inverse. So I can take the inverse. Um, so since f is a bijection, it has an inverse I'll write like with this like f, you know, f inverse. So with this little minus one thing, um, and the inverse is also a bijection. So b is related to a. Now, you could, again, you could go through and formally prove that the inverse is a, is a bijection. But actually, also, this, this, this follows from something we, that was already proved, which is that, in fact, a function has a, an inverse if and only if it's a bijection. So since f inverse has an inverse, which is f, f inverse must be a bijection, too. So. OK, what about transitivity? So suppose A is related to B and B is related to C. So what this tells us is that there's a couple of bijections. There's a bijection F from A to B and a bijection G from B to C. Okay. Um, by the way, does, well, okay. Does anyone see what I should do maybe with these two projections? What am I trying to prove, right? I'm assuming A is related to B and B is related to C. And what I want to get is that A is related to C, right? That's how transitivity works. So, okay, I've got these two bijections, one from A to B and one from B to C. Uh, the thing you want to do, yeah? Composition. Exactly, take the composition. So, so maybe let, I don't know, let H be the composition of G and F. So, so remember the so the composition of G and F. What it means is, um, you know, it's this function where you apply F first and then you, then you apply G. So H, you know, the domain of H is A, the codomain is C, um, and it is a bijection. from A to C. Um, so again, you could go through and prove that it's a bijection. Although there is something, there's something in, prop, in chapter seven, I can't remember one of, which proposition it is. Uh, one of the propositions in chapter seven implies this. But sorry, I can't remember which one it is, but the proposition says that, essentially it says if F is a bijection and G is a bijection, then the composition is also a bijection. It shouldn't, I think it's not hard to find. Okay. So, okay, so this, this equinumerous thing is an equivalence relation. Um, and so this is like gonna be the meaning of 
like when we say that two sets have the same cardinality, what we want to say is that there's a bijection between them, right? That's going to be the meaning of having the same cardinality. So just a bit of notation. Um, if A and B are equinumerous, in other words, if there's a bijection from A to B, or from A to B, you know, we write that, that the cardinality of A equals the cardinality of B. So, if, so in other words, if you write cardinality of A equals cardinality of B, what it means is that there's a bijection between them. So, um, so for, for some integer, it's a positive integer k, let's define, so, so this is going to be a set. So if I write k times the integers, or k times z, that's just all the multiples of k. So it's k times n, where n is an integer. So in other words, for example, if I take 2 times z, that's going to be contain the number 0, 2, 4, 6, dot, 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 and also negative 2, you know, dot, dot, dot in this direction. So as an example, the cardinality, well, of, of z is equal to the cardinality of 2z. So in other words, what this is trying to say is, if I, if I look at how many integers are there, and I say how many even integers are there, there's just as many of both. So the number, in some sense, this is saying, yeah, the set of all integers has the same size as the set of all even integers. Right, this is even ones, right? Which already seems counterintuitive because clearly it seems that there's more of these than there are of those, but um, in this sense, there's not. Is it clear what I'm trying to, to prove here? Yeah, you're not multiplying like, the number of elements in the set, you're multiplying the elements of the set by two. Yeah, totally, yeah. Okay, so to prove this, what we want to do is find a bijection. Um, so let f be the function from the integers to the even integers defined by f of x equals 2x for all x in the integers. So first of all, this is a well-defined function because for every integer, it gives me, you know, the output is two times the integer, and that is a, that's an element of, of this set. So, um, so this is a well-defined function. Uh, is it injective? Well, it's pretty easy to show that this one's injective. So you let x, y be in the domain such that f of x equals f of y. So that tells me that 2x is equal to 2y, which implies that x is equal to y. Okay. So in this case, like this is the whole proof that it's injective, right? You just say, okay, let f of x equal f of y. You figure out what does that mean, and then you get that x is equal to y. Is there ever a, um, like a proof where injective fails? Because it seems like it's just always going to be the same thing that's just going to mirror each other. Uh, for example, if I, like the function f of x equals x squared is not injective, for example.
like where, where, where f is from the reals to the reals. And the reason is because f of negative 1 is 1, and f of 1 is 1. But negative 1 is not equal to 1. So, so this is, so to prove something's not injective, you just need to find two different points that have the same output. But in this case, you can't have two different points with the same output, so that it's, it's injective. So with something like that, you wouldn't do like the x and y thing, you just try to find a point? You try to find a pair of points which are not the same point, but they have the same output. Because this, this, you know, because you have, uh, here you have f of x equals f of y, if you think of this as x and that as y, but x is not equal to y. So, yeah. So, so yeah, things are not always going to be injective. Uh, so for surjectivity, we take something in, in the codomain. So let y be in the codomain. Um, so this implies that y is equal to 2 times, let's say, n for some integer n. But that implies that if I take f of n, well, it's y. So therefore, um, you know, y is in the range of f. So f is surjective. OK, and then you can say, therefore, so since f is injective and surjective it is bijective so yeah the number of integers is equal to the number of even integers in some sense or more precisely yeah these two sets have the same cardinality. Here's an example to play with if you, uh, if you want some practice with this. So to prove that the naturals, so the set of positive integers, has the same size as the set of all integers. Okay. So perhaps I won't do this one. But, I mean, the method is sort of the same thing, right? Just find a bijection from one to the other. Okay, let's, let's do an example of how to kind of show that two sets have the same size. Or how to show, yeah, cardinality of A equals cardinality of B when we're dealing with infinite sets. This will also give us some practice with, uh, with this concept of, uh, you know, bijections and, and that sort of thing. So I claim that so as an example, I claim that the cardinality of the intervals 0 to 1 is the same as the cardinality of the interval from 1 to infinity, which might seem counterintuitive because this one looks a lot bigger, right? <laughs> it's infinitely long. But in terms of cardinality, they're the same size. The, that might be sort of the right intuition. Now, when you say like, is the reason you know is the reason why? Well, I mean, the reason that this is equal to this is because there exists a bijection. But that's not that's not very good intuition. I think what you're saying is probably good intuition that you can sort of yeah. Well. I mean, essentially what you want to say is I can match up the elements of this thing with the elements of that set in some way. But, uh, yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's prove this. So to prove this, what we need to do is find a bijection. <clears throat> so the notes give a specific bi bijection, which is just taking f of x equals 1 over x. I'm going to do a different one just because why not, you know, give a bit of variety. To show, and also to illustrate, there's, there's not just one bijection between these things. There's many bijections between them. 
it doesn't matter which one you pick. It just has to be a bijection. So, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let f be the function from 0, 1 to 1 to infinity defined by f of x is 1 over 1 minus x. Okay. You know, for all x in this interval. Okay. One kind of subtle thing is, I mean, is it even clear that this is well-defined? So what it, what it means to be well-defined is that like f of x has to be in this set for every x. Um, so f, so let's, let's double check that, that f is well-defined. Okay, so if, uh, so what I, what I need to show, okay, I need to show several things. I need to show that f is well-defined, meaning for every x, f of x is actually in this set. Then I need to show it's injective, and I need to show it's surjective. So we need to show that f of x is in this set for all x and 0, 1. Because otherwise, it's not even a function, right? It would, this would just fail to be, you know, fail to make any sense at all. <clears throat> So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to say, you know, for, well, so if x is in the interval 0 to 1, then what that means is that x is bigger than 0 and x is less than 1. But that implies that if I take 1 minus x, okay, imagine I, well, maybe I'll do this in more steps. So negative x is less than 0. And negative x is less than negative 1. What I've done here is I've multiplied this by this inequality by negative 1 on both sides. And what that does is it flips the inequality. So 1 minus x is less than 1. And 1 minus x, oh, sorry. This should be bigger than negative 1. If I now divide both sides by 1 minus x, so well, actually, really, this is all we get from this. So, So here, I'm allowed to divide by 1 minus x because 1 minus x is not 0. Um, and so we get this. So therefore, f of x is in 1 to infinity. Okay, Because f of x is 1 over 1 minus x. And what we've demonstrated is that this is bigger than 1. So this is um, a well-defined function. Okay, That was kind of a technicality. but. Hopefully, in most cases, when you define a function, it's clear that f of x is always in the codomain. But in this case, I don't think it was completely clear, perhaps. Yeah? No, I'm just not too familiar with the, um, what you did after the second step there, where you put the minus x part. I just added 1 to both sides. And then I just divided both sides by 1 minus x. This one, this one isn't going to give me much information, but essentially, this allows me to divide by 1 minus x because I know 1 minus x is not 0. So I can then divide both sides by it, and I can get this. OK, this is, yeah, this is a bit of a technicality, but. <clears throat> OK, let's prove injectivity. How do I start 
but uh, an injectivity proof, does anyone remember? Well, what does injectivity mean? <laughs> that's that's a good <laughs> that's a good call. Yeah, indeed. Um, so you want to prove that if f of x equals f of y, then x equals y. So so let x and y be in the domain such that f of x equals f of y. So that's I mean essentially. Whenever you do an injectivity proof, this is the, the starting point. Let x and y be in the domain such that they're, they're equal, like the function at x and y are equal. Okay, and then from that, you want to show that x must be equal to y. So if f of x equals f of y, by my definition of f of x, that means that 1 over 1 minus x is equal to 1 over 1 minus y. And then it's just algebra, right? So we just kind of, let's try to solve for x or something. So maybe I'll multiply both sides by 1 minus x. So I get 1 is 1 minus x over 1 minus y. I can also multiply both sides by 1 minus y. So 1 minus y equals 1 minus x. And if you just kind of solve for x and, you know, well, basically solve for x here, then you get x is y. Basically, subtract 1 from both sides, move the x to the other side, the y to the other side, and you get x equals y. So that's, that's really all there is to it here. So... You assume that f of x equals f of y. We deduce that x is equal to y. So we can say now f is injective. <clears throat> so like, yeah, this is really the, the procedure for an injectivity proof. Start with assuming this, conclude with this, and then you can say, we got it. You know, it's injective. Any questions about that? Okay. <clears throat> I think surjectivity ends up being a little bit trickier. So for surjectivity, we need to show that, so, So every element of the, the codomain <clears throat> has a preimage. Meaning, you know, we want to show that there exists x in 0, 1 such that f of x equals y. So I think like it's not it's not necessarily easy to just guess. So okay, why so by the way, why has to be any you know, why is any element of the codomain? It's not always easy to guess what x should be <clears throat> such that f, you know, which has the property that f of x equals y. So it's sometimes useful to do a sort of side calculation for this. To kind of figure out what x should be. So as you know, in part in, in the sort of uh, the proof here, like our next step would be let x equal something. But I'm sort of gonna so this is sort of outside the proof where I'm gonna do a little bit of a side calculation to figure out what x should probably be, you know. So I want f of x equal y equals y. So what I want is that one over one minus x is y. 
So we're trying to figure out what should x be. So let's solve this equation for x. So if I kind of multiply by 1 minus x on both sides and divide by a y, I get 1 over y is 1 minus x. So maybe I'll, so x is then, let's write it just as 1, 1 minus 1 over y. So I would say that this is officially not really part of the proof. But this is just kind of figuring out what. And now here, I'm just going to let x be that value. Okay. So <clears throat> it might not seem like it, but there's, um, there's sort of two things that I need to show here. So what we kind of need to show Well, first of all, we need to show that f of x equals y, because that will, I mean, that's kind of the whole point of x is that it's supposed to map to y. Can anyone, well, can anyone kind of see what the second thing we need to, like, we just need to kind of verify in order to make this make sense. Um, maybe it's, yeah, maybe not that easy to see, but. Yeah. Can you just check that the that x doesn't match to multiple different y's? Ooh. Actually, that's sort of, well, actually, that's sort of not going to happen because of, I mean, f of x is sort of well defined in the sense that it always just equals 1 over 1 minus x. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, that's a good point. Actually, maybe I should mention that right here. So, so that's actually not what I was thinking, but, but that make, I mean, so this is kind of an okay definition because we already know y is at least, you know, y is bigger than one. So this is, but I should probably mention that, you know, this is well defined because we're not dividing by zero, so. Um, so the thing I'm kind of looking for here is uh, that this is satisfied, because this would be nonsense if, if x is not in the domain of f, then I don't, it doesn't matter that f of x equals y, like that doesn't help me, right? So we need to show that x is actually in the domain of f, right? Because what we wanted to show is that there exists an x in the domain of f, such that f of x equals y. We kind of need to know that both of these things are true. <clears throat> so the first one of these things is pretty easy. So if I take f of x, I mean, essentially, the fact that f of x equals y is because I defined it so that it's going to work, right? I mean, that's how we kind of came up with this, this x. So I take 1 over 1 minus x. x is 1, 1 minus 1 over y. So I plug that in. We can see the ones are going to cancel. Okay. So this part's all good. Um, we also need to show that it's in the, do the domain. Okay. But is this calculation clear? I mean, essentially, I rigged it so that x is going to work for this calculation, right? So, so it better work. Um, okay. So now for the, for the second part. So to show that x is in the domain, we need to show it's at least zero and that it's, or it's bigger than zero and less than one. Um, well, first of all, the fact that x is less than one is not too hard to see. x is equal to one minus something where the something being minus is positive. So, so since 1 over y is bigger than 0, because y is bigger than 0, so 1 over y is bigger than 0, um, x is less than 1. So that's kind of a tick. Since 1 over y can't be greater than 1 in this graph. Well, 
almost, well, the key thing is that y is bigger than one. So if, I, if y was like a half or something, then one over y would be two. But the thing is, y is bigger than one. So it can't, yeah, the fraction can't be bigger than one. So, so since y is bigger than one, one over y is less than one. So one minus one over y is bigger than zero. So therefore, x is bigger than zero. So it is in the domain. Okay, this is kind of a lot to check, but uh, okay. Uh, any questions about that? Oh, so we also, so this also proves that x is less than one. So the fact that one over y is bigger than zero, maybe I should say more properly here. So that implies that one minus one over y is less than one. And so x is less than one. Yeah, you do need to show that both of these things are satisfied in order to be in that interval. Yeah, it, it essentially, yeah, it, it probably wouldn't be surjective. So yeah, if we, if we define the function differently, let's say where the domain was not this, but it was like the, all the numbers from one half to one or something, then your x would not always be in, this, in that interval and it wouldn't be in, yeah, it wouldn't be surjective. Yeah. I suppose in most other cases, it's usually kind of clear, I guess. Like if I have some linear function like 2x plus 5, if you input a real number, it's pretty clear it outputs a real number or something. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think the point here is, you know, we're trying to prove that these two sets have the same size and I come up with the function. Well, you need to show that it's really a function. Now in a test or something, or even on an assignment, you might be just given the function and told it is a function. If you're told it is a function, you don't have to verify it's a function. But the thing is, if you're coming up with the function yourself, you should probably verify that it really, that what you've done is not nonsense, that it really is a function. Um, but I think in most cases, you'd be given the function and asked to show it's injective and surjective. 